Hello, welcome to the Scholars Hub at Home. I'm Allison Gampel, Associate Director of Alumni Programs at York University. Thank you for joining us today for our lecture, Dance and Feet, Harlem and Basketball in the 1920s and 30s with Dr. Danielle Howard, Assistant Professor in the Theater Department in our Faculty of Arts, Media, Performance and Design. I'll begin with our land acknowledgement. Since we are not all gathered in the same space, I recognize that I might not acknowledge the territory that you are currently on. If this is the case, please take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory that you're on and the current treaty holders. The website nativeland.ca is a good resource for this. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Toronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. I'm grateful to live and work on this land. Before we introduce our speaker today, I'd like to share that there are several virtual events taking place this month in acknowledgement of Black History Month. You can learn more about these and our other events by visiting yorku.ca forward slash about forward slash Black History Month or by reading about them in York's monthly alumni use newsletter, York U Alumni News, which will be arriving in your inboxes this week. Uh, you might have gotten one last week that gave you some more info about Black History Month and all the amazing uh, activities that are happening on and around campus. If you're not subscribed to our newsletter, you can sign up and read the latest issue by visiting yorku.ca slash alumni and friends, click on news and stories, and then click on York U Alumni News. Okay, we like to conduct a quick poll before we begin each lecture. So today's question is, how would you rate your knowledge of the topic of today's presentation? So that poll should pop up on your screen and uh, dance and feet, Harlem basketball, 20s, 30s. How much do you know about it? Let us know. Cool. Thank you very much for, uh, for taking the, the, the time to respond. And uh, I'm glad that I'm not alone in, uh, in being new to this topic. And I'm really excited about what we have in store for us today. Um, if anyone needs help with Zoom, at this point, we're all kind of experts. But should you need any help, please do click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and enter your question. We've got a team who's ready to help you. That same Q&A button is useful if you want to submit any questions for our speaker, and they will answer it during the Q&A period that will follow the presentation. Please note that all of your questions and comments are visible to our panelists and our staff who are working behind the scenes, so please keep your comments relevant and respectful. So on to today's talk, we are featuring Dr. Danielle Howard. Dr. Howard serves as Assistant Professor in the Department of Theatre here at York. She holds a PhD in Theater and Performance Studies from UCLA and writes at the intersections of race, gender, performance, visual, and sonic culture. She is currently working on a monograph titled Making Moves, Race, Basketball, and Embodied Resistance that spans the 20th and 21st centuries. We are so pleased that she could join us today. Welcome, Dr. Howard. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. And today I'm going to be taking you all on a quick journey to the 1920s and 1930s. Shall we begin? We shall. Imagine the ballroom and casino, the home of the New York Renaissance basketball team. A long tall sign sticks out from the red brick building. There is a bar inside and the large dance floor on the second story has a reflecting glass ball hanging right down over the middle. This place is the most famous ballroom in Harlem, at one time more popular for big name society dances than the Sepoy Ballroom on Lenox Avenue. The lighting scheme spotlight, the well-respected band leader Vernon Andrande and his orchestra on a spacious decorated stage playing a swing tune that has folks on the floor dancing the Lindy Hop, a combination of improvisations, breakaways, swing outs, 
and the Charleston's instantly recognizable syncopated two beat pattern. Their feet, one foot at a time, leap off the floor in swift staccato steps in conversation with vigorous sound steadied by the percussive pulse of the drummer, Jimmy Parker, who was also a professional boxer at the time. The orchestra's big band sound is familiar as a regular act at the ring. The band's first set finishes and the dance floor is clear. Folks dressed in their evening attire, one can imagine some of them perspiring from their spirited exercise, enthusiastically file into the uniquely and handsomely designed loges on the perimeter of the dance floor. The light shift to showcase the next act enters onto the dance floor the Renaissance Big Five to compete against a local team. The reflecting glass ball hanging in the middle now illuminates the players. The crowd cheers as they witness the lightning passes and dazzling footwork that characterizes the Wren style of play. After another big win for the Wrens, the two portable baskets at either side of the court and the wooden chairs for spectators are removed. The time is about 11 p.m. The audience and even some of the players return to the floor from their seats to celebrate and dance to another set from the house band. Although the Wrens played games all over New York, the Midwest, and even parts of the South, their origin story and rituals carried elsewhere were fostered within the Black community of Harlem. Considering dancing and the basketball game as a single art making event, a shared ethos emerged among spectators, dancers, ball players, and musicians. They all played an active role in the execution of the entertainment. The ballroom space afforded opportunities for experimentation with sound, transitions, footwork, and audience participation. Through rehearsed and improvisational steps as part of an ensemble cast, the players, the musicians, and the athletes executed mastery of their talent. The basketball game itself is one act or layer within the entire evening performance that actually began when the lights were dimmed and the music started to play. Today's presentation, titled Dance and Feet, Harlem and Basketball in the 1920s through 1930s, offers a revision of what dancing might mean in the context of Harlem, basketball, and rituals of Black performance during the early 20th century. In basketball, the dribble or the act of dribbling is when a player performs a controlled dispossession and repossession of the ball. The player appears to intentionally fumble or drop the ball away from themselves in order to escape the defenders as they travel toward their team's basket. The crossover, a combination of dribbling, pivots, and shortstop moves, unsettles opponents and misdirects their attention. Crossovers require an opposing force and use subversive tactics and impeccable footwork to disrupt the opponent's trajectory and gaze. The act is rehearsed yet ephemeral and improvisational, making it a rich phenomenon of inquiry and a risky move towards power. I am interested in the fiery and delectable shapes. This is quoting cultural theorist Fred Moulton's description of Cecil Taylor's improvisatory jazz. And I'm interested in the basketball moves here, like the crossover that particular basketball players create with their hands and feet. These moves performed by black basketball players generate ruptures or breaks within both the structure of basketball game and by extension, the structure of oppression incurred by the racism players experience on and off the court. Many of us may have heard of instances in which the elite world of sports valorizes black athletes while also attempting to exploit them. There are several recent and historical examples of this which include Simone Biles, the most decorated American gymnast of all time, withdrawing from the 2020 Summer Olympic Finals that occurred in 2021 for mental health reasons, and American radio host of the Charlie Kirk Show calling her a selfish sociopath and a shame to the country on his podcast of the same um, name. Or Fox News commenter, Laura Ingram, commanding NBA basketball player LeBron James in 2018 to shut up and dribble on national TV, and NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick filing a lawsuit against the NFL, 
claiming he was being blackballed from joining another team as a result of his political statements on the field. One of Kaepernick's political statements was the act of kneeling during the national anthem in 2016 as a protest to the police brutality against black Americans after the police shootings of Terrence Crutcher and Keith Lamont Scott in September of that year. From January to August, 2020, police officers murdered 164 unarmed black men and women. Many of their cases remain under investigation and many black people continue to be the victims of violence and police brutality. I situate my research within the perpetual dismissal of black life. And as York professor, Christina Sharp puts in her book, In the Wake on Blackness and Being, the precarities of the ongoing disasters of the rupture of chattel slavery. Simone Biles, LeBron James, and Colin Kaepernick in these instances, as well as many other professional black athletes, are interpolated into an ideological apparatus that attempts to reinforce the boundaries in which professional Black athletes are to remain. My current research aims to unearth how these boundaries are transgressed through movement within and outside of sporting contests. My research has become even more urgent in the past two years as sports players have performed their activism on the court in ever more performative and direct ways. Examining sport as performance is of undervalued importance. As an interdisciplinary endeavor, my research combines contemporary theories and methodologies in theater and performance studies with black studies, media studies, and sports studies. Now, you might be wondering why focus on basketball as opposed to another sport? Some basketball fans out there might interject, why not basketball? their tone indicating their undying affection for the sport. I focus on basketball because the sport possesses lyrical combinations of movements that often offer metaphors to theorize the conditions of black lives under structures of injustice. Also, black bodies primarily constitute professional basketball team rosters and popular representations of basketball often portray racialized bodies in urban communities. The premise of my research project, for which this presentation topic is excerpted, adopts basketball as a theatrical craft that utilizes improvisation, costumes, and an ensemble and stage. In this juxtaposition of sport and theater, also examined by scholars like Roger Chow, Eero Lane, Tara Magdalinsky, Shannon Walsh, Carl Wright, and Robert Reinhardt, I do not intend to oversimplify the mechanics and nuances of either arena, but instead hope to highlight ways in which basketball performance and the performing arts intersect. Furthermore, scholars Jason King and Samantha N. Shepard tether Blackness to mobility, informed by diasporic Black people's improvisational, kinetic, and kinesthetic movement in quotidian and cinematic performances. My research reveals virtuosic and improvisational movements performed by Black basketball players as oriented towards the kinetic knowledge of freedom. Questions I consider include, in what ways are Black athletes interpolated into systems of embodiment? In what ways do they use embodied practices in a liberatory fashion? How can corporeal movements found in basketball play for example, dribbling, crossover, dunking, that I link to aesthetic forms serve as theory for identifying the strategies Black bodies use to combat racial inequality and overcome constraints. What kind of power is present in these embodied expressions? Kitty and immigrant Robert Bob Douglas founded the Rens, also known as the Renaissance Big Five in Harlem a fertile representational space of Black artistic and athletic innovation. By incorporating music into the sporting events and establishing one of the first naming rights deals in basketball, Douglas and his team laid the foundation for American professional basketball as we know it today. He owned and coached the Wrens from 1923 to 1949. 
The team was virtually unstoppable, winning over 80% of their games throughout their 26 year existence and winning the champion title at the first World Professional Basketball Tournament in 1939. Douglas took over as manager of the Renaissance Ballroom and Casino that you see before you in 1932. The venue averaged about six dances every week in the year. Vernon Andrande and his orchestra, hired by Douglas, played frequently at the Rennie. And Andrande's musical arrangements greatly inspired the choreography of the Lindy Hop pioneer Frank Manning and the sounds of famous band leaders like Fletcher Henderson and Chick Webb. Douglas started many people on successful performance careers, such as Earl Snake Hips Tucker, who was the entertainer who popularized Snake Hips dance in the 1920s, tap dancers Ella Gordon, Chink Collins, and Peter Pan Kittles, singer Harlan Latmore, and jazz band leader, singer, composer, and pianist Tiny Bradshaw. Theatrical jazz a performance genre theorized by artist and scholar Omiyo Sunjuni L. Jones was being embodied in the most unlikely space, the dance floor slash basketball court slash music stage on the, of the Rennie. This theatrical jazz aesthetic, Jones articulates, leans heavily on elements of jazz, including ensemble and individual virtuosity, improvisation, polyrhythms, the bridge and the break. It also references the modern dance idioms, the blues sensibilities, the performance art antecedents, and the ancestral calling. Mathexis, or group sharing, is achieved in practices of theatrical jazz because the knowledge is transferred through apprenticeship and genuine relationships between artists that create communities around art making, grounded in Black diasporic spirituality, aesthetics, and values. The interconnection between African derived spiritual practices and jazz in theatrical art making has roots in generations of community artists. These artists seek to engage the mind, body and spirit in notions of black theater grounded in ritual practice and the centrality of the collective. The intermingling of musical artists, dancers, athletes transformed the Rennie into a creative space for young people to identify their individual virtuosity and hone it within the concentric circles of Mathexis. That included the basketball team, the band, and the audience members from the Black community in Harlem. Journalist Dewey Roscoe Jones of the Chicago Defender wrote in 1932, Harlem is a state of mind. People there have achieved social equality, yet there is a dance hall at 125th Street where the brother is still just a part of the outside scenery. Harlemites live in palaces on Sugar Hill and in hovels in the jungles. Harlem is heaven and it is hell, depending on the way you look at it. Moreover, Langston Hughes prefaces the unpredictable shifts of Harlem within his book plank poem called A Montage of a Dream Deferred. He likens the pivots and turns and theme and style within his book to the African-American musical style of bebop. Hughes writes bebop is, marked by conflicting changes, sudden nuances, sharp and impudent interjections, broken rhythms and passages, sometimes in the manner of the jam session, sometimes the popular song, punctuated by the riffs, runs, and distortions of the music of the community in transition. Within this analogy, Hughes deems it necessary to describe Harlem through musical metaphors. In other words, the intricate soul of Harlem or its culture is unearthed through the art. For the Black inhabitants of early 20th century Harlem, the neighborhood, however, appeared as a series of contradictions, an atmosphere of light and shadows, of joy and sorrow, of transition. Yet, it was also a muse, a slow seduction to writers, musicians, performing artists, and athletes. Despite other professional Black basketball teams, briefly existing in cities such as Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and Chicago, the Renaissance Big Five was set apart by not only their pre premier skills and exceptional record, but also the city that they lived in. If you've ever been to a basketball game, we all easily hear the cheers of the fans, the bouncing of the ball, 
and the scuffed sounds of the player's feet as they shuffle, pivot, go and stop abruptly. Like Langston Hughes' musically inspired poem, the pivots and the turns the wrens performed are linked to larger African-American aesthetic structures. Former wrens player John Isaacs declared, your feet have to dance. You can't play ball if you don't have dancing feet. And if you have bad feet, you're not going anywhere. Isaacs marries dancing and playing basketball in order to underscore that they are two sides of the same coin. Not only does he articulate what he perceives as fundamental to the game of basketball, but he also alludes to the cultural conditions from which this convergence emerged. His statement indicates a keen awareness of his own feet and the feet of basketball players generally. He indicates, perhaps from realization, that feet have to dance. They have to commit to rhythm and stylized motions either rehearsed or improvised. Feet are very important to dancers and athletes. Feet ground the body, providing security and a launching pad for fast and furious or light and airborne movement. Dancing feet are ones always in preparation and anticipation of the next move. Tap, put simply, is an interplay of rhythms and amplification of sound by the feet. As these rhythms become more complicated due to syncopation, polyrhythm or double time, the footwork does as well. Contemporary tap dancer Savion Glover says, it's like his feet are the drums and his shoes are the sticks. Glover asserts that knowing one's feet is about knowing their utility and the potentiality of rhythm they provide. The New York Renaissance basketball team had a keen awareness of their feet. They were known for excellent defensive and offensive footwork and lightning passes up and down the court that disoriented their opponents and hid the strategies of their unique plays. Teamwork and passing set the rims apart from other professional basketball teams. At this time in basketball history, dribbling was not a principal device for ball movement and maneuvering around players in order to shoot the ball in the basket and score. Passing among teammates was, and still is paramount in moving the ball along the court. When an offensive player found themselves dribbling into a strong defender with no perceivable way around, they might hear teammates reminding them, get it off your wrist, treat it like a hot potato, make it hum, give and go. John Wooden, 10-time UCLA champion basketball coach who recalled playing against the Rams Big Five many times as a young athlete in the 1930s, remarked, over 60 years later that the Rens were the finest exponents of team play he'd ever seen. Although players changed through the years, the style of play and the ethos of the Rens centered on teamwork remained remarkably consistent and effective. Sports writers described the Rens with colorful language that informed the public of the Renaissance Five's earned prestige. New York Amsterdam News noted after the Rens versus Syracuse game in mid-December 1929 that Bob Douglas colored champions functioned like a well-regulated, well-oiled, high compression machine and sparkled like the purest of crystals in the bright sun. Their offensive plays were deadly in their precision. They were lightning fast in their execution of their moves. And in addition, they presented a defense as impregnable as the rock of Gibraltar. In another game that same month against the Passaic Russian team, the Rens gained a lead of 18 points in the first 10 minutes of the game. The sports writer noted an ex exhibition of passing that for its rapidity and deafness could not be surpassed. Their bewildered opponents were dazzled by their passing accuracy and speed. And six years later, in March, 1935, another black newspaper narrated the team's consistent performance. The Wrens brought their fans to their feet time and time again, with Tarzan Cooper ably playing his famous role as pivot man down near the foul line. The ball was whipped into him with bullet-like speed and shot back like a vulcanized boomerang. It appears as if the Wrens were hurling golf balls against the concrete wall, with the towering of Tarzan playing the part of the wall and the ball bouncing back with the speed of a bullet. The Wren's performance on the basketball court carried a particular lexicon that was consistently present within early 20th century newspaper articles. The Wren's overall performance can be perceived two ways. 
On the first level, words like precise, deft, and machine emphasize both the intellectual and practical activity involved in ball play perfected through observation, practice, and experimentation. On the second level, metaphoric phrases that include the words sparkle, dazzling, deadly, vulcanized, and lightning evoke a godlike, Herculean symbology that accentuates the aesthetic nature of the Wren's execution. While the Wren exhibited the rarest artistry of the court, the Harlem Globetrotters, who were just as successful in terms of wins, perpetuated trite stereotypes of Black males that circulated in early 20th century performances of Black-based minstrelsy. Abe Saperstein, a Jewish businessman, organized the Globetrotters from Chicago Savoy Five team in 1927. He deliberately used Harlem in the team's name so that the public knew that the Globetrotters were a black team. I don't have time to discuss the Harlem Globetrotters in detail here today, but I certainly welcome your questions afterwards about them in contrast to the Harlem Rent. The New York Renaissance and the Harlem Globetrotters were two of 12 teams at the first professional basketball tournament that took place at the Madison Street Armory in Chicago on March 26 through 28, 1939. This competition was the first time any black bat professional team was allowed to compete against a white team for the official champion title. With the defeat of the Globetrotters in the semifinal round, the Wrens faced the white team Oshkosh in the final game. Charles Tarzan Cooper, William Popgate, Puggy Bell, Wee Willie Smith, Clarence Bath Jenkins, Ayer Sage, and John Isaac played for the Wrens in the professional tournament. 3,000 fans, mostly Oshkosh fans, witnessed the Wrens win. The Wrens won $1,000 for their efforts. The headline to the small article in the New York Times read, Renaissance wins 34 to 25, Negro Five beats Oshkosh for national pro title. News coverage of black teams rarely occurred in the New York Times through the white community, though the white community was aware and attended their games. However, the win of the championship title for the Rens set a precedent in the be being a part of the all the news that spit to print section of the art of the newspaper. Since the founding of the club in 1923, it was Douglas's desire to see his team officially declared world champions. He had finally achieved his goal. Despite the Wrens never being selected for their country's leading professional basketball team, the NBA, they obtained legitimacy in the eyes of their black and white opponents during the Jim Crow era of the 1920s and 1930s through their movement on the court. Bob Douglas was the first individual of African descent to be inducted into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame in 1972 before his death in 1979. The New York Renaissance team's place of origin in a hall, Harlem ballroom as well as their proximity to the sophisticated and experimental nature of jazz tradition inspired their style of play and consecutive victories. Their spectacular presence on the court and Douglas's perseverance and business savviness pushed back against negative representations of African-Americans. The first professional black basketball team of this caliber owned by a black man paved the way for basketball's rising popularity in the United States and around the world. Through an unlikely source, basketball made visible the portrayal of black men as excellent athletes, adept entrepreneurs, and social pioneers. The legacy of Robert Douglas and his team lives on today through the moves and muscle memory of elite black athletes who resist the status quo and persevere towards racial equality. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was that was incredibly fascinating, and uh, we're absolutely uh, delighted that you've uh, that you've shared your research um, with us. So so much appreciated. You're welcome.
Yeah, so we're going to take some time for Q&A and actually the questions are already have already started to come in. So okay. to, our, to our audience, I'll just give you some quick instructions on how to ask your questions. So I'll ask them on, uh, on, on your behalf. So use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type in your question and I'll ask it on your behalf. Um, if there is anyone that's watching live on Facebook, you're welcome to submit any questions um, in the comment section for the video on Facebook. Okay, and those will get uh, directed to me. Um, so I just want to start by asking, how did you arrive at this kind of research project? What was your inspiration? Sure. Um, so I arrived at this research topic from a myriad of pathways. Um, as a Black student athlete uh, and a performer growing up, um, I lived with an experiential connection uh, between sports and arts. Um, and then during my graduate education at UCLA, I was already interested in Black liberatory practices. And I was also interested in juxtaposing unlikely case studies together. So one of those case studies, for example, was I was thinking about Henry Box Brown, who was an enslaved uh, Black man who shipped himself in a box from Virginia to Pennsylvania um, to rid himself from slavery. And then he later became a magician in England. And um, I put that with a conversation around 1970s jazz musician Sun Ra and kind of what that unearthed. So I was already interested in these kinds of connections. And then I, um, I started to go to the Venice Basketball League games, which were um, in Venice Beach, California. And I was going with my friend and we were talking about performance studies and things of that nature. And I started to kind of break some things down from what I was seeing on the court. And from there, it came to a much deeper conversation and digging of history. And then this is how this project kind of came about after that. Awesome, thanks for sharing. Um, sure. Rebecca says, I'm just gonna read it. Has Dr. Howard such rich, important, careful research crossing the performance of art, dance and sport and black expressive cultures, improvisation and survival. Thank you so much. Um, Rebecca would love to hear more about what it's like thinking across disciplines and improvisation. And if you have anything more to share, you know, now feel free to share more of what your thinking is around that. Sure. Um, I think it's it's very exciting uh, it can, in terms of thinking through um, these different frameworks. Um, and I really think that performance studies, kind of as my home discipline, really lends itself to going down these different pathways and taking certain kinds of risks. Um, now, given that I, I ground a lot of my work in improvisation through the jazz tradition and the fact that jazz was actually happening within these ballrooms, it's actually a, a, an easier connection to be made between what was happening in terms of the jazz aesthetic there and basketball. Uh, within my larger work, though, I then moved from you know jazz music, then I also think about improvisation as it comes into dance history, um, and you know I do think that from that experiential knowledge and dip, kind of liking to dip my hand in these different you know different disciplines, um, putting those things all together becomes a really necessary experience uh, that they're not as um, separated in boundaries as sometimes they are articulated to us within the academy. Really interesting. I remember sort of uh, during some of my business studies, applying some of those same concepts, you know, jazz and improvisation to the business world and the business. Mm -hmm. um, and ex it extends, you know, really interestingly and creates some some amazing possibilities. Absolutely. I, yeah, I want to ask a, a question that's coming from Mike. So um, Mike asked. Oh, Mike asked two questions. Um, let me ask the first one. So Mike says, fascinating talk, Dr. Howard. People are people really appreciated your talk. Thank you so much. Um, and Mike says, were there any subtle differences in the athletic aesthetic between African-American and Afro-Latinx groups within the Harlem community? Did these groups come together or diverge aesthetically over time? That's a great question. Um, I would say that from so far, the research that I've pulled from, you know, newspapers and archives, that there wasn't a lot of aesthetic differences in the sense of the people in Afro-Latin community living there would still utilize these spaces as well. So they became a part of the Mathexes that I talked about, that group sharing aspects. Um, and also something to mention too, uh, Bob Douglas was actually from the Caribbean and came to the United States. So even that, another international connection in that regard 
was being brought together. And really it be basketball and jazz and these kinds of performative nature really helped to create uh, a way for healing really from different communities um, together in these spaces. And I think that part of it is something that definitely needs to have more research in terms of those connections. But certainly from what, I, what I've been able to pull so far, um, they were kind of using the same vocabularies uh, or dance vocabularies in the spaces. Thank you. I'll, I'll turn to Mike's uh, next question. Mike asks, mm -hmm. mentioned the Wrens were a well-traveled team. Can you speak more on their experience barnstorming in other areas, particularly the South? Was the experience similar to barnstorming teams in baseball's Negro Leagues? Did they ever play all white teams? How would you characterize coverage of these events? Absolutely. Um, there was, there's a whole bunch more that I wish I would have been able to get into today. Um, but to briefly answer your question, so there, they barnstormed a lot in the, in the kind of mid-level, not in the early 20s, but towards the mid-20s. Um, and they played, like I said, a lot of places in Chicago because there were other Black teams there. But when they'd go to the South specifically, um, they were not allowed to stay in any particular hotels. And so pe they would go specifically to um, HBCUs, historically Black colleges, and they would play there. Um, and they played a lot of white teams. And at this time, um, when playing white teams, they were not supposed to be considered games or competitions. Uh, they were only considered contests. They only, so this was a huge impact when 1939 came with the competition uh, in, in Chicago, because this was the first time that uh, two black teams were actually allowed to compete against white teams and not be considered just a contest, but a real competition. One of um, the Rand's biggest competitions were the original Celtics. Um, and there is a connection between the players on the original Celtics team and the, the Celtics that came out of that in terms of um, the Celtics that we know today, there's a heritage in that connection. And uh, the playing with this particular team, and I, I, have a, I have a writing on kind of going through that relationship. Um, there are people within those two teams that become friends. And there's even a particular moment when I think in a game in the South where one of the players of the original Celtics kisses on the cheek another player from the Rams and people are uh, uh, very offended and very upset. And even the, the original Celtics gets kicked out of the hotel for this experience. So there is um, a dearth of information about the kinds of teams that they played and they played multiple. The Rams um, played multiple teams in multiple weeks as this was the way that they became, tried to make a living. Well, thank you. You know, there's so many questions coming in that I'm not sure we're gonna have time to get to them. And, and so many people, it seems like have a very deep personal connection to the topics that you're, you're covering. So um, I'll, um, I'll just read out the question uh, that Ted writes. Um, Ted writes, I played b-ball in several Harlem gyms, Riverside Church and, um, mm -hmm. and the YMCA at 135th. Boom boxes were everywhere those days, and we often warmed up to tunes like Sweet Georgia Brown, like the Globetrotters. It was a great way to get into the rhythm and have fun. Did the Wrens use music when they warmed up? What's the role of music? Um, I can't say for sure, but what I can see from the proximity of the space and as well um, how the games would be right in the middle in terms of they would have a jazz band up and then they would have the Rams play. There, there is an easy assumption to be made at that point where there was music going on in the background because there were rehearsals on the same spaces and stages. Um, and, you know, even historically within Harlem today, I talk, you know, about, about basketball in terms of the court indoors, but the street ball culture um, is a whole nother pathway to explore, especially when it comes to the utilization of boom boxes and the warm ups and sports. And even um, there are there are many different basketball players, particularly uh, from the 60s and the 70s, um, like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, for example, who was under the coach of uh, Wooden, um, who talks about his relationship to jazz and his own warm-up practices um, and relationship to hearing jazz and performing the footwork for uh, the games. 
Thank you. Um, and sort of speaking to, to footwork and movement, um, a question that comes in from uh, from Seika, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce Seika's name, um, asks um, if, if you can elaborate on the movement on the court that dribbling, you know, if, if dribbling was not as prevalent in the game in the 30s, what it means in terms of how the team move the ball around the court and liberatory practice is, is that that's exciting to consider what it, you know what does that mean can you comment on that absolutely um i was able to see a brief some a very brief footage uh in terms of the movement and the, and the rapidity of the movement that was happening and the fact i think when it comes to the liberatory practice um, i think it comes from one the level of collaboration and as one of the uh, newspaper art article um, writers had said, a well-oiled machine. Um, and so when we think about a ball uh, being possessed and then dispossessed, but yet maintaining it within kind of a, uh, a certain kind of network, we can also think about that as um, a way of opening up um, a liberatory practice within a scene of subjection, especially in the sense of the Harlem Rens who experienced certain uh, racism when they were on the court. There's actually a point where Isaacs, um, one of the people I mentioned who had the quote about dancing feet, he talks about the fact that sometimes um, spectators would stick out their umbrella so that the players could trip. And so when we think about uh, these kinds of things happening from the spectators and the kinds of movements that were happening on the court, we can kind of marry those and think about them um, in conversation with one another. Thank you. I'll turn to Andrea's question, who says that, thank you so much, Dr. Howard, for your brilliant presentation. Can you talk some more about the Harlem Globetrotters relationship to minstrelsy? Absolutely. So kind of to give you a brief overview is that I did mention that the Harlem Globetrotters were um, a team that was concurrent with the Harlem Rand. Um, however, the Harlem Rins was actually coming out of um, out of Chicago, and it was owned. the The team was specifically owned by Abe Safferstein, a businessman. And there was actually one of the players from the Harlem Rins. I mean, from sorry, from the Glo the Harlem Globetrotters, who mentioned he said that Abe Safferstein is about the money. And so often, what would happen in his connection to black minstrelsy is that. The instead of playing um, the, the sport of basketball in a way that honored or elevated the Harlem community, um, the, the Harlem Globetrotters were really attempting to gallivant around as these black characters who would create comic shows, um, who, would, who would present themselves in certain aspects as clownish um, in order to put people in the seats um, as well as present themselves as connected to Harlem. And so the minstrelsy not only comes from the actual performances within the court, but also the relationship between uh, that team who was not from Harlem and did not have the sentiment of Harlem calling themselves the Harlem Renaissance um, and performing as if they were, they were creating characters, if you will, of the Harlem um, sentiments and the Harlem sensibilities. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so I'll, I'll turn back to actually the first question that was asked, and David asked the question probably from uh, and entered it just early on in the conversation when he were talking mm -hmm. about Renaissance in those times. And David asks, are those elements of Renaissance still rele as relevant today as they were back then? I would say they very much are. You know, the, the Harlem Renaissance team itself was disbanded uh, right kind of before the consolidation of the National Basketball League. So, which, which began in, I think, 1949. So because of that, they were not kind of into the legacy that the National Basketball League has, but in terms of uh, these liberatory practices when under scenes of subjection is very much, as I said, kind of at the end of my talk, um, that I argue is within the muscle memory of different athletes. For example, specifically looking at the 1960 civil rights movement in the United States and the, the myriad of athletes that came out of that space um, and how you know that those connections, for example, uh, really did help usher into even today when we're looking at different athletes um, refuse, refuse certain, um, were certain 
pressures that are being put on them as a result of their athleticism. Um, and so even though the Renaissance basketball team is not still around today, I argue that the history of the Renaissance basketball team and the embodied knowledge that came from those players that has been passed down through the actual rehearsal or the practice of basketball in this sphere within the United States context is still uh, a living and still important for our understanding today. Thank you. So that, that, that just about wraps up our time together today. So um, I, I wonder if you have any last thoughts. Um, certainly, uh, this is just the, the it's careening the tip of the iceberg of, of the amazing research that you're doing. And, uh, and we're really, really happy that you've taken the time to share it with us. Um, do you have any other sort of comments or thoughts to add about really how you think Black performance conveys the significance of, of Black history? And we're at the start of Black History Month. Any, any thoughts you want to share before we conclude today's event? Sure. Um, just briefly, I will say that uh, in terms of Black performance, I've kind of entered this under this this large understanding right from the space of liberatory practices and forms of resistance. And one thing that's very important to my research is arguing how uh, really in Black performance, it's imperative to to have aspects of resistance. Um, it's imperative to improvise through constraints. And so that aspect really speaks to the significance of Black history um, in that for many reasons, but particularly for anyone interested in Black history to realize not only how it connects to United States history in terms and also connects to civil rights, but for any of those who feel, uh, who have experienced oppression in their respective countries can look to Black performance, not just as an aesthetic, but as the beginning of an analytical practice in thinking through how to resist and create a world that we all want to live in. Thank you so much. So um, You're welcome. certainly on behalf of the alumni engagement team in the Division of Advancement, we are so grateful that you've taken this time, you volunteered your time to share with our wider community the research that you're doing. Um, I'll, I'll just read two notes of thanks that have come in from our community. Andrew said, well done, very informative. Thanks for doing this. And Mike said, can't wait to read your monograph, Dr. Howard. Thank you for your responses. Um, you've so thoughtfully responded to the myriad of, of questions um, and uh, ex exposed us to a really interesting um, intersection of thinking. So thank you so much uh, for your work and, and for spending this time with us. Thank you. Okay. So you can turn off your video now, Dr. Howard, and, uh, and I'll just wrap up our event today. Um, to, uh, to friends who are with us uh, virtually. If you would like to share today's session with family, with friends, colleagues, it will be posted uh, shortly on our YouTube page, youtube.com forward slash York U alumni. Uh, you can also watch any past le lectures you've missed. There have been some fantastic ones um, like today's. Uh, we've got a final poll question for our audience and it's going to appear on your screen. The topic is, how would you rate your knowledge of today's topic following the insightful discussion that Dr. Howard has just led us through. So it's up on your screen. I'll give you a moment to respond. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for responding and thank you for your participation. Um, Scholars Hub will return next Wednesday, February 6th with Professor Shao, who's an Associate Professor of Organization Studies with her very timely session titled Reactions to COVID-19 News Overload and Its Impact on Work. Following that, the next session will be on March 2nd with guest speaker Johnny Rungtasanatham, I hope I pronounced that properly, um, who is the Canada Research Chair in Supply Chain Management and a Professor of Operations Management and Information Systems at the Schulich School of Business. And his presentation is titled, Managing for Severe Supply Disruptions, Top Research-Based Tips. You can register for upcoming Scholars Hub sessions at yorkie.ca forward slash alumni and friends, uh, as well as uh, keep up to date on all of the work that we're doing uh, with and for our alumni community. Um, again, thank you all for, for being here with us today. Thank you again, Professor Howard. And um, it started to snow outside, so uh, be safe, be well, and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.